<coughs> okay. So, uh, you've had a tough two weeks, uh, but the end is, uh, end is nearing, so uh, welcome to the last, last day of the school. So, no more exercise sessions today, just uh, two lectures. So, now we will finally get to the glasma fields. What is this glasma? So, it's kind of a... We have talked about the glass, and the glasma is kind of a word that Larry came up with to, to dis describe the thing that is between the glass and a plasma, a plasma of gluons in, uh, in this case. Okay, um, so now we want to study the situation of what happens when you take two heavy ions and let them collide, and do, these two heavy ions are described in the CGC framework as classical color charges and then classical color fields. Okay, so we write the current, so we have a current for a uh, plus component, so plus component of the current, which is uh, lives on the x minus equals zero light cone and is described by some color charge density rho one, which for example we can take from the MV McLaren Benogopolan model. And then we have another current which describes another nucleus going in the other direction, in the minus direction, uh, living on the x plus equals zero light cone and it's described by another uh, color charge density, and then I also recall that this is a little bit of a formal way of writing. Really, you should be thinking of this as a row, which depends on x plus, but it's kind of very peaked, very sharply peaked, clo clo almost a delta function, uh, and the same thing for, uh, for this one. So this is a little bit of an abbreviated, abbreviated way of, of writing this. And so yesterday, we did a gauge transformation to the light cone gauge, and uh, and we saw that this kind of a current corresponds to a gauge field which is uh, in the light cone gauge, which is like a theta function in x pl uh, plus, x minus. So it lives on one side of the light cone. And correspondingly, this one corresponds to a gauge field which is a theta function uh, in x plus. And here we remember that this gauge field, we, we made a gauge transformation, a gauge choice, that A plus is equal to zero, but because this nothing here depends on X plus coincidentally, uh, fortunately, uh, the solution also had the property that also A minus is zero. Here, vice versa, we have made a gauge choice that A minus is zero, but uh, fortunately our solution also has A plus equal to zero, okay? So kind of at least on the, on the light cones and without uh, interactions, it seems that this fortunate coincidence uh, re re resulting from the glass aspect that these don't, this doesn't depend on X plus, this doesn't depend on X minus, allows us some kind of a consistency that A plus and A minus can both be zero. Uh, looks like they, they can both be zero for these two solutions separately, okay? So what happens, uh, now what happens in when you, we try, so okay, so now we want to try to solve the classical Young-Mills equations with, uh, with these kind of uh, currents. Now let me draw my favorite space-time diagram. This is the x plus axis. This is the x minus axis. So this is an A1 and this is an A2. These are two pure gauge fields that are completely in, they don't know anything about each other. We know that here we have chosen a gauge where there's nothing here. This is kind of here in this part of space time. We're sitting here, one nucleus is coming towards us, the other nucleus is coming towards us. We haven't seen the nuclei at all, so there's nothing there. In this region, we have this A1 gauge field. Okay, so in this region of space-time is we're sitting here, 
the nucleus coming in the positive direction has already passed us. It's, it's gone by, but the one going in the other direction is yet still coming towards us, right? So we have seen one of the nuclei, it's went through, but the other one is still coming. And, and here, so there's no energy density. This is a pure gauge field that doesn't carry any energy density. Uh, but the field is non-zero. In this gauge, there is a, there is a color field living in this part of space-time, which we don't, kind, somehow don't see because there's no energy density, but it's still there. The same thing here, this is the other one. So here we have another pure gauge field. So this part of space-time is the part where that nucleus is still coming but the other nucleus already went by and, and it left behind it a, a color field, gauge equivalent to vacuum, okay? And now what we want to do is that we want to find the mu, we want to find the gauge field here, okay? And this is the plasma field. This is the plasma field and we want to find out find out what it is, and in principle, I mean, we know what to do. We have a current, we have an equation of motion, uh, we just set out, <coughs> set out to calculate, okay? Um, I need to introduce uh, coordinates that you probably might or presumably many of you already know, but just in case, uh, it is convenient to use the coordinate which is the proper time, which is defined as 2x plus x minus, you can also see that this is t squared minus z squared, and the space-time rapidity, which is defined as one, one half log x plus over x minus. So in the space-time diagram, x plus, uh, x minus, a, a surface of constant proper time, constant tau, you can see that it's a, <coughs> it's a hyperbola. So a surface of constant tau R is a hyperbola, so tau is going that way. And then a surface of constant eta, eta constant means x plus divided by x minus is constant. So a surface of constant eta is a straight line in these, uh, in these coordinates, okay? And then, um, Yes, and then I also recall that this, these pure gauge fields, A1 or 2, I, uh, let me write this, 1, 2, trying to keep my indices straight with uh, not, uh, not very easy, is uh, a Wilson line, one of the two Wilson lines, Di, and then the Wilson line of nucleus 1 or nucleus 2, uh, so we have these expressions for these uh, for these pure gauge fields, and then this Wilson line. You remember that this this Wilson line is something that is uh, calculated path ordered exponential minus e g d x plus or minus a covariant gauge. Or let me put it like this: row one or two, one or two, row one or two divided by gradient squared. So from some color charge density, we can calculate the Wilson line. From the Wilson lines, we can calculate these fields. Okay. <coughs> Good. So now we want to, plus or minus, yeah. <coughs> so now we want to solve what is this gauge field. And um, we, so our, our, situ our fields have fortunately have the, have some Still, there's still some gauge freedom left for the reason that our, our solutions for a single nucleus accidentally had some component, accidentally had some component of, uh, <coughs> had some component zero just because of the, the glass uh, nature of these, uh, of these color charges. <coughs> so that still leaves us some, some gauge freedom and we want to use that gauge freedom in a smart way. Uh, and the smart way is um, <coughs> kind of related to the fact that want is really, uh, we want to use the full power of the CGC as an uh, CGC as an effective theory. So what we want to do is that 
These gauge fields come from the small x degrees of freedom, the small x, small x gluons, and, and we want to forget about these currents as much as possible. So somehow we want to work in a way where we're kind of here, we're just working about once we get into this region, into the forward light cone, we can forget about the currents and we can just work with the fields, okay? Because then that is using the full power of the effective theory to somehow get rid of things that are uninteresting and just have a theory for the things that you are interested in, okay? <coughs> so, <coughs> so, um, so we, we need to choose a uh, gauge in, a, in the smart way. So in the region three inside here, uh, we should have d mu f mu nu equals zero. There's no currents there. And we somehow want to do this in a way that completely forgets uh, the currents, okay? So this is the equation we want to solve. Uh, we need an initial condition. We're going to solve this as an initial condition problem. For at tau equals zero. So on this tau equals zero covers both edges uh, of this light cone. Okay. And then we're going to make, make some simplifying assumptions. So... Uh, Boost in, we're going to assume that the fields are boost invariant. So that the fields in this region three only depend on expert and proper time, but do, do not depend on this, uh, this eta. The justification for this is really that we, would exp we are working in the limit where the collision energy is infinite. And, uh, and we would, I mean, we would expect that we should find a solution where the fields are boost invariant. So there's two, uh, just as a side note for, yes? Yeah. Yeah, so this, you remember, so this current, we, this is the solution we did yesterday. So from such a current, in its light cone gauge, one can find a solution where the gauge field radiated by a current with a plus component has a transverse, is a transverse gauge field. So this is kind of from this, this and this is the thing we did yesterday. You can from this, you can first in the covariant gauge, you find a gauge field that has a, only a minus component, but then you do a gauge transformation that gets rid of that and generates an AI. So there is a solution of the young louis equation, the equation of motion, that from this current gives such a field. So that's already after the gauge transformation. Yes, this is already after the gauge transformation that we, that we did yesterday. Okay, now we're working completely, we are not working completely in after the gauge transformation. So a note about the boost invariance. Some of you are used to hydrodynamics, I think, uh, do hydro. So in hydro, you also do boost invariant hydro often, that's the Birken solution. So there's two kinds of boost invariance. In some sense, what I would say that the boost invariance in the sense of Birken hydrodynamics is what I could call a weak boost invariance. It is boost invariance in the sense that, <clears throat> it is boost invariance in the sense that uh, pressure, energy density, so on, are independent of uh, space-time rapidity, eta. Here we have a, this uh, boost invariance at the level of the fields is a much stronger uh, condition because the boost invariance at the field, uh, at, the, at the level of fields, what it means is, so, so the rapidity is a longitudinal coordinate. It's kind of like a boost invariant version of the Z coordinate. If you go to exactly mid rapidity, the rapidity is proportional to the Z, uh, Z coordinate. So the fact that these fields do not depend on eta means that their derivatives with respect to eta are zero and the derivative of a field with respect to a coordinate is the momentum. So this means that this kind of fields, in some sense, in a, in a Lorentz covariant sense or boost invariant sense, do not have longitudinal momentum. And that is much stronger uh, because it means that I, even in a Birken hydrodynam hydrodynamics, if your hydrodynamical solution is boost invariant, it is still the fluid is isotropic in its local rest frame, 
which means that the particles in, in a Björkane hydrofluid have momentum in the z direction. They, they have an isotropic distribution of momentum because they are a thermal system in the local rest frame. So they have momentum in the z and uh, transverse directions. Here these gluons do not have momentum in the z direction in somehow to the extent that we can define what the momentum of a gluon is. So this is a stronger condition than boost invariance in hydrodynamics. Uh, but that's, it is kind of the, the condition that follows from the fact that square root s is infinite. It, it's the, uh, it is a, it is a con let's, let's put it this way, from these equations we, we can find a solution which satisfies this, right? <coughs> so, so I'm just taking a shortcut and assuming that we, this, is pr this property is true already. Uh, but uh, and you could you could probably start do this by starting that assuming that maybe there's a boost invariance and then see that okay the solution has a boost invariance later but it's just easier to do the calculation this way. Good. <coughs> so then the gauge choice. In general, we can choose one component of the gauge field uh, to be zero. Um, one component of the gauge field to be zero here. Until now, we have two components, plus and minus component zero, kind of partially by accident. That was uh, a property of the solution so far for the single nuclei uh, separately. <coughs> um, this, um, so we will, so it turns out that the smart gauge choice is to choose the tau component in this to be zero. Why is that a uh, why is that a uh, smart choice? First of all, having a tau component is that's a kind of a boost invariant thing. Having a zero being zero is uh, is not boost invariant, so it's inconvenient. Um, <clears throat> it kind of matches with the single solutions here. We had light cone gauges where both the plus and minus components were zero. Uh, so. <clears throat> Plus and minus components were zero, so this is kind of somehow consistent with uh, with that. And and it, but there are several other advantages. I said that we can want to get rid of the currents. So what it turns out, and we will see this in the expressions uh, when I, I write them down, is that the gauge choice a tau equal to zero has the nice effect that. So you remember that the current always has to be covariantly conserved. This has to be true for the current. Now, there's a plus component of the current here. And, uh, and if we had a A minus here on this light cone, this A minus would color rotate this current. So the A minus kind of, a, and that's kind of why the covariant gauge is inconvenient. Before we did the gauge transformation, this guy had an A minus component. And if the field of this guy has an A minus component, it would color rotate the other the current of the other guy. So we would constantly have the gauge fields going forward. We would have the gauge field of this guy color rotating the charges of this guy. And vice versa, we would have the color charge, uh, gauge field of this guy color rotating the gauge field of this guy. So that's inconvenient. One can, and in some limits, there's one calculation in the dilute limit where this is done in a covariant gauge, and you have to take care of this gauge, gauge, rot, gauge field of one nucleus rotating, color rotating the current of the other nucleus, and, and it becomes a mess. It is difficult to deal with, and it kind of keeps these currents involved in the process, because that if we have this gauge rotation, Somehow the gauge field of this guy is ro color rotating this, and that leads to radiation. So you have gluons. More, um, this is constantly contributing to the to the gluon radiation. So we don't want that, and this gauge choice avoids that. Okay. So a tau is. Do I have the <coughs> expression? Yes. So a tau. I have to check that I have this right. Is uh, a tau is x plus a minus plus x minus a plus over tau is zero. So you kind of see that it, it matches in an, when we go to x plus equals zero, this condition means that a plus has to be zero. And when we go to x minus equals zero, the condition means that a minus has to be zero. 
and that's just the right thing to avoid this color precession. So that, that, this gauge choice allows us to kind of find out the initial condition for the fields and solve this equation and forget about the currents. In some other gauge, you could not do this as, as easily, but in this gauge, in this gauge, you can, okay? Um, there's another advantage for, the, uh, for this, uh, this kind of a gauge choice. This is a temporal gauge choice. <coughs> and this equation is a nonlinear non equation. Uh, we are not going to be able to solve it analytically uh, fully. We can solve it either perturbatively in some approximation or we solve it numerically. If we want to solve this equation numerically, the easiest, best known technique to do so is to work in a temporal <coughs> gauge. Uh, the temporal gauge allows you, allows you to write in a gauge invariant way the equations, this kind of an equation of motion uh, and solve it, on the, solve it on the lattice. So it's also very convenient for the numerics. So we will be choosing, we will be using this, uh, this gauge choice. <coughs> but then the other one, the other component, A eta, so let me actually write A eta, well, this will not be zero. So we cannot fix the, that, that's, uh, for this problem, we cannot uh, have both of them zero. This one will have to be non-zero once we have chosen this one to be zero, okay. Good, so this is the gauge uh, in which we work. <coughs> so let us do the calculation. Um, I'm gonna need, uh, <coughs> So this calculation for the initial condition was first done by Kovner, McLaren, Weigert in uh, 95. Okay. So there's a two, yeah, okay. I mean two, 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 for me, there's two important KMW papers and, and this is one of them, Kovner, McLaren, Weigert. So the way we will do this is that we will write an ansatz. We will write an ansatz for these fields where we say that <coughs> Our transverse gauge field is uh, the transverse gauge field of nucleus one, nucleus one, and the nucleus one transverse gauge field is uh, lives at positive x minus and at negative x plus. So these theta functions just put me in this region of space time. Then I have the other one. Now, nucleus two, theta of minus x minus and theta of x plus. This is just setting the, uh, this field, uh, picking out this region of space-time. And then we have our unknown gauge field, AI3, which lives in the positive future light cone, like this, okay? So we will write this, this kind of an ansatz and plug it into the equation of motion. Then uh, the A eta uh, gives us the ansatz for the other components. So it's for the, at this stage, it is still convenient to work with the plus minus components. So they are not independent. They are both given by the same A eta. So the A plus minus components are plus minus, uh, and these only live in the future light cone. The, the, the single nucleus solutions do not have plus or minus components now that we have gone to the light cone gauges. Uh, then you need to have an x plus minus and then an a eta with an eta upstairs and this uh, matters, yes. Okay, so we will write this kind of an ansatz and, we, and, the, and then we will plug this ansatz into our equation of motion. plug into d mu f mu nu equals j nu. And now we're not, and, and what we're looking for is the initial condition. So you see that we have kind of, I have introduced these theta functions here. <coughs> this equation has derivatives. Some of these derivatives will be operating on these theta functions and giving delta functions. And these, of course, these delta functions are just completely unphysical, artificial things that were introduced by my ansatz. So they have to cancel, okay? And the canceling of 
contributions that are proportional to delta functions, delta functions resulting from derivatives of these theta functions, I, I will require that these, the coefficients of these uh, delta functions cancel, and that will give me a relation that that will give me a relation that allows me to get the initial condition for these these unknown fields. Okay, and that will give me the initial condition for the for the Glasma field. So you plug it into the equation of motion and match coefficients of delta x plus delta x minus that are that result from differentiating these derivatives. <coughs> okay, so let's look at the first one. So the first initial condition is uh, we want to match a singular or cancel a singular correlation a singular contribution that has two delta functions so i'm differentiating both this theta function and this theta function so there are lots of components in this equation and i don't want to go through all of them because i mean you can afterwards go and check that everything works but I'm just going to use the one, pick out the ones that give me the initial condition that I want. And then as an exercise, if you want later on, you can go through this equation and check, check everything. So how from this equation could I get uh, a contribution where I have two derivatives? Uh, the way to get that <coughs> is that I can take the transverse component AI and then I can have a plus and minus derivatives from one one from the here and the other one from the derivative in the f mu nu okay and and since if i'm taking mu is if the index mu is plus and minus then nu is going to be a transverse index because it's the index of the trans uh, transverse index of this one and so i'm going to be looking at the ji component and the current has no i component <clears throat> so my equation is that ji, which is equal to zero, and then uh, I have to uh, be careful, um, then uh, note that, yeah, okay, so let me, um, here, I got, I'll take the mu to be downstairs, so this is a, a plus, for example, downstairs. So now this is a d mu. So I'm taking mu down, mu mu down to be plus. Then here f mu nu. There is a, a mu plus mu equals plus upstairs, which is a mu equals minus downstairs. So one of the the components here is going to be a d minus, and it's going to be operating on on this a. AI, right? And then it turns out that there are, that's, uh, yes, uh, that's, uh, that, then of course, in principle, I could have a, in principle, I could have a, so there's other terms, in principle, I could have a, no, I can't have anything. I can't have anything else. That's it. Yeah, uh, that's the only thing. That's the only, only uh, thing that can be, give me two delta functions like this. Okay, so um, I de differentiate, and of course these derivatives. I mean, could I mean, or at this point I don't worry about the derivatives acting on these. I just worry about the derivatives acting on the theta functions because I want to get two uh, two delta functions like this. So very straightforwardly, uh, I get here, I differentiate this, it's a plus delta function. Here, a derivative of theta of minus x plus is a minus delta function, okay? So the first term gives me a minus a i uh, one. Uh, the second term, likewise, differentiating this theta function gives me a minus delta function. Differentiating this gives me a plus delta function, so I get a minus uh, ai2. And then here, derivatives acting on these uh, give me both plus, 
So A3 uh, comes with a plus. So delta plus uh, delta function x plus delta function x minus plus other things that are not as singular. Okay. Ah, so I have my first initial condition. This must be zero, which means that my gauge uh, transverse gauge potential in the region three, the initial condition at tau equals zero, has to be a sum of these two, right? Now this is why I somehow asked you to ask you to somehow calculate as an exercise last time, uh, as a as a short exercise, that even if these two are pure gauge fields, the sum is not a pure gauge field. So now I have an a ai a transverse gauge potential, which corresponds to a non-zero energy density. It corres actually corresponds to a longitudinal magnetic field inside the future light cone here, but very at tau, tau approaching zero from above. So at in initial time, initial slightly positive tau, I mean infinitesimally positive tau, that's the, that is the initial condition. Good. So that's my first, uh, first initial condition. Uh, then the other, and that, that's the, <clears throat> and that's the only that's the only term that has two delta functions. Okay. So then uh, I will need to go a little bit uh, further, and uh, to get the other initial condition. So now I have initial condition for this. I still need an initial condition for that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> And for that, I need to go look at contributions where not, where not both of my derivatives are acting on, uh, acting on these theta functions, but something is, some derivatives somewhere are acting on, on the gauge fields, and only one, of the, not one is acting on, on the theta functions. Um, ah, yeah, so there was one thing that I was going to say, sorry, uh, going a little bit back. You might think that I could get a delta, this kind of a contribution by having two derivatives acting on this. That would be the case in uh, d plus f plus minus or f plus i, which would be j i. So this would have a d, uh, no, I can, I can have a minus here like, that, like this. This would have a d plus d minus acting on a minus, but if I if I differentiate, if these derivatives act both on these theta functions, I will get a delta function of x plus delta function of x minus, which is multiplied by x plus or x minus. So, so in principle, I get a contribution that is like delta function delta function, but it goes, but it doesn't actually contribute because it's a delta function times the argument of the delta function, and that's zero. So I do not get these kind of contributions from this term at all. Okay. So they, so these, uh, uh, so this doesn't contribute. I don't, I don't worry about this. Uh, I don't worry about these things. So now let's go forward, and now we want to match the other ones. So now let's choose, uh, so now the situation is of course symmetric plus or minus, so I can choose either plus or uh, minus, so I will choose one of the options and I will match, I think, I will match, oh, I will match, oh, you will match this one, well, okay. I will match uh, a delta x minus and a theta, theta plus or theta plus or minus x plus, okay, this kind of a contribution. So I will match contributions where I only get a delta function in x minus, and then the other derivatives, in whatever derivatives they are, act on something else, not, not on this theta function, but on the fields, okay? So this kind of a contribution, a delta of x minus, uh, is, is associated with the component of the current uh, that lives on this light cone that has a delta x minus. So uh, this is, uh, I need to look at the j plus j plus component, the equation for the j plus component, okay? So in this equation, 
I need to take this uh, in, this index to be <coughs> plus. Okay. So there's a so there's a couple of terms. There's a couple of terms where uh, such contribution, a couple of terms that we need to worry about in this uh, in this one. First of all, let's look at. So we're looking for this kind of contributions in the equation for J plus. First, uh, we have a, a contribution in like contribution from D minus, and I want to have a minus derivative acting on the theta function to give me this. So I'm looking at the D minus F minus plus uh, part, okay? Uh, so this is D minus, and then I have to be careful. I have to be careful. I can have either D plus A plus, so this is this minus pulling this minus down d plus a plus, or then I can have I can use the fact that this is anti-symmetric, so this is plus minus, and the f plus minus is going to have a term which is d minus a, so minus like this, so minus d minus a minus. Okay, and then other plus the commutator terms. Uh, this one has commutator terms, but I'm not, uh, I'm not worried about the commutator terms, right? Because they don't give me this kind of singular, they don't give me these kind of singular contributions. Good. So uh, this gives me, so I take this delta uh, de derivative with respect to, uh, Okay, good. So here I have d minus d minus d plus acting on a plus. So a plus the sign here is plus. The minus derivative acts on this and bring, makes it turns it into a delta function. And now the plus derivative acts on this x plus, right? So I have a minus derivative acting on this plus derivative acting on this, uh, giving me a giving me just one. So what I'm left with is a, uh, from that is a theta of x plus and uh, a eta. And then I have with a minus sign here, I have two minus derivatives acting on a minus. So a minus altogether has a minus sign. So there's another minus. And then one of the minus derivatives acts on this one and gives me the delta function. And the other minus derivative acts on this one and gives me one. Uh, so I also have a minus theta x plus a eta. And uh, the whole thing is, uh, has a delta of x minus plus plus the other terms which, you, which do not give such a, uh, such a, uh, such, such a thing, uh, which don't give some, anything singular like that. Okay, so this means that this is two times a eta. Eta, uh, delta of uh, x plus minus theta of uh, x plus, okay. So I get such a contribution and this contribution has to cancel against some other component, uh, some, some other component in this equation, okay? So then uh, what other components can we have in the J plus equation? We can of course have transverse components. So first we can have a transverse derivative di fi plus and uh, now this, this one can if I take, uh, if I try to use this, this A plus, of course, com contributes to F I plus, but then you only have transverse derivatives, and then you have transverse derivatives, and there's no way to get the singular contribution by act active with having derivatives acting on see, these theta functions. So in order to get some kind of a delta function in, delta function in X minus, I need to take the transverse uh, gauge field here, 
uh, and now I have written it with an uh, with an index down, so I need to de uh, do a little bit of gymnastics here. So this is minus f plus i. Then I lower. Then this is minus. I can the I can lower the index plus. So this is minus f minus i. But then if I lower the minus index, I get I get another minus sign. So f minus I, okay. So to get the signs right, I mean, I was, I've done this several times, and I every time have to struggle to get the signs right. Signs right. Uh, so uh, I will have a term that has a di of, and then f minus i has a term which is d minus a i, like this, okay. <clears throat> now I can ha I can take this derivative acting on my ansatz here. So this will mean that I have a di, and then this derivative is supposed to be give me a delta function. So I'm going to have a one i with a theta of uh, theta of minus x plus, and I'm going to here, I'm going to get a minus sign, so I will get a minus a2 with a theta of uh, x plus, and here I will get a plus a3 <coughs> i i with a theta of x plus, and then the whole thing has a delta of x minus, and then other terms which are other terms which do not give anything uh, which do not give anything singular. Okay, so now I'm gonna look at this for uh, positive x plus. I'm, I'm just interested in in matching kind of here and not here, okay? Uh, so positive x plus, and uh, mean, meaning that I, I throw away this because it doesn't, this term, it doesn't, doesn't matter for positive x plus. And here I recognize that using my, uh, the previous condition that I already had, I recognize that this with the minus, I have a3, minus a2, so this is actually, this is actually ai of, ai1 theta of x plus. Okay, so I could have kept this uh, in here and then it would be ai1 one theta, this theta plus this theta is just ai, so I, ai1, uh, didn't matter. But anyway, the term that I get here is this and there's a, <clears throat> and there's a delta function, and then there's a delta function uh, uh, with x minus. Okay. Now this contribution does it? Uh, is it going to cancel? Is it going to match? Is it going to cancel this one? No, because uh, what this contribution goes into is that this actually cancels the j plus because this is kind of a a d de derivative of a1, and the and the a1 is the field generated by the plus current, right? So it's not the whole. There's also a commutator term, but anyway, this term goes into canceling the current, the j plus current on the right hand side, uh, and then yeah. So there's a commutator term here which I have not written, but that 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 uh, together with the commutator term uh, one one gets the j plus. So now from this equation, from this equation we have we have cancelled the delta minus delta x minus term on the right hand side. We have gotten the j j plus term. Uh, but that doesn't leave us anything to uh, cancel this. Okay? So to cancel this we have to look at a further term which is the commut which is a commutator term. So in this Covariant derivative, I can, 
I can take the gauge field from the covariant derivative, and then in this f mu nu, then I need to dig out the delta function, uh, dig out the delta function in the f mu nu. <coughs> and how do I, uh, how do I do that? I can have in the f mu nu, I have a derivative of a i. So here you, uh, the del this, uh, the this delta function actually came from the derivative within the f mu nu. So I can get uh, I can get a singular contribution by looking at the commutator term, which is i g a i f i plus. Okay. <clears throat> so here, this is uh, I basically have the same thing except that instead of this derivative, transverse derivative, I have an i g and then, I don't want to get messed up, <coughs> I do not want to, I do not want to get uh, messed up. So again, let me look at this for simplicity at x plus uh, greater than zero. <coughs> So uh, this a i at x plus greater than zero is a is a theta of um, theta of minus x minus a i two plus a theta of x minus a i three, right? And then that the other term in the commutator. Here I can uh, I reorganize this using that this a i three is the sum of a i one and a i two. Uh, I combine the a i two terms, so I get that I see that this is an a i two without any theta function. This is a theta function of something minus something plus theta function of something. It's one uh, plus a theta function of x minus a i one, okay, and then uh, the commutator of that with what is here, and uh, this is the same thing. So a commutator with a i one theta of x plus like this. Okay, and then maybe com uh, did I? Yeah, I maybe neglected some. Maybe uh, maybe neglected some commutator terms, and then of course yes, here this one comes with a delta function of x minus. Okay, good. So um, here I have a commutator of a two uh, with a one. And that's certainly non-zero, and uh, it comes with a kind of a delta function. So that actually can give me something that uh, can compensate this, right? So if I uh, clean up a little bit the mess and uh, take into account this uh, factor two here, I can write down the initial conditions. Initial conditions at tau equal zero, which are that the transverse component is just a sum of the transverse fields of the individual nuclei. And then the eta component, eta up, eta upstairs, is uh, i g over two. And uh, if I have the, if I get the signs right, uh, this is a i Two commutator AI one commutator with AI two. Good. So these are the initial conditions of the of the plasma fields, and I think uh, this is a good place to uh, take a break and like ten minutes, fifteen minutes, and then uh, the the after the break we will kind of. 
not really calculate that much anymore, but somehow draw pictures and, and somehow try to discuss what, what these fields look like. Good, so let's take a break here. Good, so let's, let's continue. So we now found the initial conditions. We now found the initial conditions of our plasma fields in the inside the future light cone, and uh, then we just uh, plug them into. The idea is that we just plug them into this equation of motion and, and solve as an initial value problem. Uh, Actually, of course, to solve this is a second-order differential equation. So, in order to solve the, uh, in order to solve it forward in time, you need not only the initial condition for the fields, uh, but you need the initial condition for the derivatives of the fields, time derivatives of the fields. Uh, and but the other initial conditions, it, it turns out, it turns out that the other initial conditions are zero. Kind of the, the initial condition for the time derivatives of the fields are zero. Uh, which I checked a long time ago, but uh, was not uh, wasn't prepared to uh, do here. I think it's essentially um, essentially kind of in some sense. I think what one crucial thing is that uh, these are these are now fields that depend on tau. So if I look at the Nah, nah, I'm not going to try to do it because I'm not. Uh, I don't remember how it exactly goes. So, I turn, so the time, deriv the initial conditions for the time derivatives of these fields are zero. Okay, and that uh, a similar, similar uh, argument. You have a similar careful ar argument uh, will tell you that, uh, but uh, I will not try to do that. I will not not try to go through this argument here. Okay. Instead, let's discuss a little bit what these fields uh, look like. So I'm trying to recreate Larry's famous picture that, that you see in a lot of places. I'm not sure how, how, successful, how successful I am. So this is a cartoon of the nuclei which have now passed through each other. They're flying away. <coughs> they're flying away from each other at the, at the speed of light and there's something, something in between. So on the nuclei I have these uh, uh, fields. Oh, try to do some color coding here. So I have a on the nuclei following the light cone. I have a, I have these gauge fields of the gauge fields of the single uh, nucleus, which, as you remember, so these are. These are an F i plus, which is which are proportional to, which go with the current. So these are so there are, an, an F i plus means that there is a transverse electric field, and a transverse magnetic field. So transverse always with respect to the beam axis, but these are on the light cone. So these are the Whitechaker Williams fields that follow the char color charges. Okay, so every. Just like a charged electron, an electron has a photon cloud, cloud of Whitechaker Williams photons accompanying it. A color charge has a cloud of Whitechaker Williams gluons that are accompanying it. These are kind of, these are normal gluons in the sense that oh, they're going in the z direction. They have polarization, electric and magnetic fields, uh, orthogonal to it, orthogonal to each other, and orthogonal to the direction of the gluon. And and both of these. Uh, both of these nuclei have these kind of electric and magnetic fields. Okay, so then if you calculate, and this is a little bit the calculation we did uh, uh, yesterday, or yeah, or the, the, not yesterday, but the previous uh, in the exercise session, uh, if you calculate from this. Uh, If you calculate um, uh, from this gauge potential the Fij, uh, this, potential, this initial condition gives you a non-zero Fij. 
So i and j are x and just transverse components. Okay. So if i j is a magnetic field in the z direction, okay. So this means that between these receding sheets, we have chromomagnetic fields that are extending and those are those are in between they are not they don't live on the sheets but they live in the region they live in the region in between so we have a z component of the magnetic field then there's also uh, so what does this a eta correspond to uh, correspond to physically um, let's go a little bit back to the the definition, so we had, we had an A plus minus, which went like something like X plus minus A uh, up eta. Uh, <coughs> so this means that I can calculate something like, uh, I, I have an F, um, I have an F plus minus component of the gauge field, uh, uh, field strength tensor and an f plus minus component is an f plus minus is an f minus minus right Min plus up is minus down so so there is something that is a d minus a minus and here this a plus minus proportional to x plus minus means that means that this such a thing is proportional to this a eta so what is an f plus minus? Remember, pluses and minuses are linear combinations of zero and uh, three, right? So an f plus minus component is uh, up to some signs and factors and uh, whatever uh, is an f zero three component of the gauge field strength tensor. If you're doing the linear combinations, so an f plus minus component is an f zero three component. And what is a zero three component of the field strength tensor? Uh, that is a electric field in the z direction. Okay. So, so there are also there are also color electric fields that have just a z z component. Uh, in the initial condition. And somehow, in, in fact, this structure is, um, is something that I think, in fact, if you just assume that your fields are, you have boost invariant field configurations, and you require that your energy density is finite and not blowing up like one over tau at tau equals zero, uh, I think it's actually, I, I think what actually happens is that these are the only kind of things that you can have. I don't think you can have, uh, I think you, if I remember this correctly, I think you cannot actually have transverse, transverse electric and magnetic fields here in the bulk uh, and a finite energy density and boost invariant uh, gauge potentials at the same time. Yeah, so let's come to the border effects. Uh, so what is the, how, one way to understand this, okay, so it looks like, <coughs> so you have this charge line, so exactly as you said, this looks like a capacitor, a color capacitor. So it somehow means that somehow effectively there are, there are electric charges here, color, color electric charges. Okay, that's fine, we know that there are color charges. That, that's, uh, that's, that's okay. This is, uh, this is something that you have in the Lund, uh, Lund string model too. Uh, you have a collision and particles fly away, beam particles fly away, and there's a color string between them. They're ringing. So this, this electric field, at least superficially, is not that different from a Lund string, okay? Uh, except in ways that we will... The physics interpretation understanding is very different, but at this level, you draw this, this is not uh, not unlike a not unlike a uh, a, a, a string, 
But then there's also this magnetic field. So this means that if you precisely think of, as, uh, as you say, that there's a magnetic field from one sheet to the other, it looks like these are also kind of magnetic capacitors, right? So there's, it's like there's magnetic monopoles on these sheets. Right, my magnetic, two magnetic, two opposite magnetic monopoles on the receding nuclei, and then they pull, they they create a magnetic field in the z direction between them. So, this is pretty weird, right? So, let let, let me give you a mathematical. Uh, let's let's think of a my, my favorite mathematical uh, somehow analysis or explanation of this. This whole thing, um, well, actually here inside inside the vacuum, okay. Uh, or if we kind of, let's say, if we forget the currents, in some sense, in some sense, the, if we forget the currents and these fields, which are, so these fields, transverse fields on the sheets that are associated with the currents and just concentrate on, forget the, forget the, forget, sorry, forget the currents, the J's, uh, but somehow just consider these transverse fields, but because, because somehow here, these initial conditions, they don't directly involve the color currents anymore. These are these fields in terms of these fields. So it is uh, these fields in the middle, the z, comp z direction fields are expressed in terms, of, in terms of things that really correspond to the Whitecker-Williams fields, uh, the transverse electrical magnetic fields living on the current that are like gluon clouds that are accompany accompanying, the, accompanying the color charges. <coughs> And uh, so we have a system of we have a system of color fields, and uh, color fields satisfy uh, a color version of the Gauss law. So what is uh, what is Gauss law in electrodynamics, electromagnetism? Gauss law tells you that the divergence of the electric field is related to the charge density. Okay. So here, if we forget about the currents, uh, we don't have a charge density, but our Gauss law is a covariant colored Gauss law. Uh, so our fields have to satisfy uh, an equation that says that the covariant divergence of the color electric field is zero. And now here I'm changing conventions and our I is one, two, three, okay? Just, uh, And then uh, the, from the fact that uh, from the fact that the field strength tensor is a commutator of covariant derivatives, it follows as a mathematical identity that uh, so-called the Bianchi identity identity, which says that which says that the covariant the magnetic field. is source, has no source, okay? So this is without charges, but just the gauge fields, a, any color gauge fields satisfy this identity. And this is of course the uh, non-abelian analog of the one, one of the other Maxwell laws, which says that the magnetic field, that the magnetic field, uh, divergence of the magnetic field is zero. That the, uh, the condition that says that there are no magnetic monopoles in electrodynamics, Though the divergence of the magnetic field is zero, and that follows directly if you just t say that the magnetic field is a um, is obtained by as a what is the rotor or uh, the, the uh, anti-symmetric de derivative of a gauge potential, it follows as a mathematical consistency requirement that the magnetic field has no uh, sources. So here in color with with color, these are the derivatives in the Gauss law and the Bianchi identity are covariant derivatives, okay? So why don't I just separate this out and uh, separate out this out and I will write this equation in the form di ei is minus i g ai and uh, ei, like this. And I will write this in the form that di bi is minus 
I G A I commutator B I like this okay so these are now the charges of the capacitor and these are the magnetic monopoles of the magnetic capacitor right uh, if I just think of if I just look at this picture and I think oh there's uh, this lines between two sheets uh, it's it's like a capa it's like a capacitor uh, then in this this picture when in this picture i need to think of the derivative not the covariant derivative but the but the true thing that is conserved is the covariant derivative uh, so i can just take the commutator term with the covariant derivative move it to the other side of the equation and and think of these as a, think of these as kind of some kind of an effective effective charges effective charges and effective uh, magnetic monopole densities okay so this is my these are my magnetic monopole densities and these are my these are my electric charges okay so this is the so so in 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 chromodynamics you have this you have uh, this kind of things just uh, these are mathematical identities and and if you want you can right turn, take the term and move it to the right hand side. Um, well, um, not well. In principle, I think yes. The problem with this kind of thing is that all the time I'm working in the square root s is infinite limit. And the beams have an infinite energy, and it doesn't matter how much they lose, they still have infinite energy. So, so I think, uh, so in some sense, energy. Con so, the, to rephrase your question, you're asking about energy conservation, and energy conservation is a very difficult question when you start out at infinite energy. <laughs> so it's it's hard to keep track of energy conservation. Yeah. Um, so. Um, yeah, so I'm not exactly, but, but somehow, so you need to go beyond the icon approximation somehow to pose this question in a reasonable, in a reasonable way. And of course, people, there's a, people are trying to go beyond the icon approximation in, in various ways. Uh, but it's, it becomes difficult because we use the icon approximation to make life much simpler. Good. Uh, so, so these uh, color electric charges and color magnetic monopoles are 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 the result of a result of what Larry McLaren calls the color glass fairy sprinkling magic color glass dust okay <coughs> so 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 the so the the way one so the way one could think uh, the way one can think is that you have here on the right hand side you have electric and uh, so note that the the eyes here don't need to be the same. Here we can this eye can be a three component on the left hand side, and on the right hand side the eye can be a transverse component. And that's actually I think what happens here is that the way you should think about this is that you have a DZ BZ, which is a, a transverse and and B transverse. Okay. And the same thing here. And, and what are these? So on the left-hand side, this BZ, that is the plasma field, which has a longitudinal component. On the right-hand side, you have a, you can take a transverse component of the magnetic field. Uh, well, you have transverse components of the magnetic fields, right? Here, uh, these white secure williams fields that are just following the color charges and they're kind of go, going away with the beam, here you have a magnetic field okay and then you need a gauge potential but this gauge potential uh, is the transverse gauge potential of uh, of this guy so this nucleus had its light cone gauge uh, transverse pure gauge potential which lives which lives in everywhere in space time in, in <laughs> where this nucleus has passed. So this gauge potential lives everywhere to the left of this nucleus that is going that way. So this nucleus has a light cone gauge gauge potential, 
which uh, lives everywhere here, and uh, by interacting with the magnetic fields of the Weizsäcker Williams uh, gluons of the other guy, they create something that kind of looks like a magnetic monopole density. And then this magnetic monopole density acts as a source of this uh, longitudinal magnetic field that span from this nucleus to the other nucleus. Okay. Of course, these are, these are just words. I mean, equations are what they are, and, and, and then you look clearly. But I think this is an amusing interpretation, amusing, amusing interpretation of what, uh, uh, what these look like. Okay. Yeah, so this is the, so, so the pure gauge field here is, is the color glass fairy and it, and it sprinkles magic color glass dust on the, glue, on the white checker Williams gluons of the other guy, turning them into color monopoles that act as a source of, and of course somehow the way this everything is somehow the, the equations are symmetric so it kind of, the way this is built is, is somehow has to happen in the, in the way that somehow for a uh, magnetic monopole here, there's an exactly opposing magnetic monopole here because kind of the equations in, I mean, when you write it like this, the equations are completely symmetric in, in, the, in the two nuclei. Writing it like this, it seems very, and, and I, very, not, very uh, not at all symmetric. Good. So these are the, these are the, these are the plasma fields. Uh, okay. And uh, then, of course, this uh, sets, sets up a lot of speculation of what, whatever exotic, uh, exotic effects. One thing that you notice is that, okay, B and Z are both in the Z direction. So on average, so there's a Chern-Simons charge uh, in this field configuration, which of course fluctuates. There's no net Chern-Simons charge, but there's a Chern-Simons charge. But, I, but of course, you could get a similar fluctuating Chern-Simons charge from any any field configuration, any random field configuration. So I'm, is not quite clear what the implication, yeah. Is the impact of the double power on the central plasma machine this image, let's say, frames? Well, there's no absolute, I mean, it, it's very hard because we start the calculation at infinite energy. Yeah. It is very hard to quantify what the, uh, what the lower bound is. Typically, I think people start, do, start, typically people start just as a, a convention in the field. People start, people start using this kind of a picture at x, x less than 0 0.01, which corresponds to uh, like, so okay, 0 0.01. So kind of this would mean like 100 GeV uh, square root. If the nucleon mass is 1 GeV, this would mean like 100 GeV uh, collision energy. But this is just a, there's no calculation behind this number, right? <laughs> it is just the, uh, the number that people use, and then of course brave people push uh, to higher, push to lower energies, and and somehow then worry about non-iconal effects of of lower energies. So there's no somehow solid answer to that question. <laughs> okay. So uh, what? Um, so I said that okay. You also also the Lund string model has longitudinal uh, longitudinal uh, glue, uh, longitudinal electric uh, fields. So is is this somehow the same? And I would say that no. In my opinion, this is very different from the Lund string model. Uh, of course, there's the longitudinal magnetic field, but that's not actually the big difference in terms of physics. In terms of physics, the the big difference is that in the Lund string model, these receding particles. I mean, are all the time pulling these, uh, pulling these strings. Lund string model takes, uh, really considers the energy of these receding particles. They're pulling, pulling the strings, and when they're pulling the strings, they're doing work and they're pumping energy into the, into the mid rapidity region. And then eventually, this energy and this energy is stored in the Lund string model is stored in the potential energy of the string. So that's where the energy you have. A, Two hard particles, they, they get a lot of momentum. You get a lot of momentum in the initial condition, and then you have the 
particles that are go moving away, they're losing energy, and the energy is lost to the potential energy of the electric field. And then this potential energy is released in some Schwinger mechanism, uh, hadronization mechanism at the hadronic scale. So you kind of store energy in potential energy of the color field, and then this is release it in non-perturbative mechanism into hadrons. Okay. So here, where is the energy? And the energy is not really, I, I, I don't think it's a good way to think of the energy being in the color, in the potential energy. The energy is in the fact that uh, all of this, everything here, depends on the transverse coordinate at the scale of 1 over qs, the saturation scale. And, and somehow here, if one tries to do somehow phenomenologically, qs, uh, QS is 1 to uh, 2 GeV, and conceptually, in all of this calculation, QS is a weak coupling scale. So we are all the time doing a calculation where we assume that QS is much larger than lambda QCD. Uh, we have been doing a weak coupling calculation. Well, we have been doing a classical calculation, and the validity of this classical calculation requires uh, the coupling to be weak. We are not doing a we are not doing a quantum calculation. We're, we're keeping the coupling constant. We're not taking into account confinement here. So, in spite of being a non-perturbative calculation, this is a weak coupling calculation. Uh, there's a there's a characteristic scale. And, and when you say that fields depend on transverse coordinate at the scale of 1 over qs, uh, this means that these fields, if you, you can always Fourier transform, and you can go from the transverse coordinate to transverse momentum, and this is what quantum in quantum mechanics, momentum and coordinate are related by a Fourier transform. So if your fields depend on the transverse coordinate, it means that you can somehow more or less, uh, more or less vaguely, and, and it, uh, think of these as as kind of gluons uh, with some kT. So we have a gluons with kT of the order of qs. And contrary to the Lund string model, in the glasma, this is where the energy is. Kind of, if you want to have a, if you want, to, of course, when you solve the equations of motion, you don't think about gluons, you solve the equations of motion in coordinate space. But if you want, want to have a physical picture of what are the degrees of freedom, you, it is actually not that bad to think of this as a system of gluons, which are very, very strongly interacting in the beginning. That's why you have to non-perturbatively solve the interactions by the Youngman's equation. But nevertheless, uh, it is not a bad approximation, bad at least in conceptually, to think of them as gluons that have kT of the order of qs. And this means that the energy of the system is not stored in the potential energy of a field. In the Lund string model, kind of the field is homogeneous. Although the string has a width, but it's the width is large, and somehow the energy is in the potential energy. Here, the energy is stored. It's better to think of the energy being stored in the transverse, in the kinetic energy of gluonic modes that have momentum of the error of QS. Okay. Good. So, um, so that about the physical interpretation. Now, uh, I will not really talk about the ways of numerically solving these equations. They are, that would be an interesting topic in itself, but it would take us uh, more time. I would just say that this, that the equation of motion uh, in the vacuum can be solved by lattice, uh, lattice numerical methods. And uh, instead, let us plot, uh, think a little bit about what does the solution, what does the solution look like Okay, so if you solve the equations of motion and you plot uh, in terms of qs tau, the time I use define some qs from the let's say the MV model in some using some convention, okay, and uh, <clears throat> and what happens is that and I plot I make two colors here. These are supposed to be more or less on top of each other, but uh, since my drawing abilities are 
tran tran the uh, transparency aspects are are a little bit limited. I will draw them like this. Um, <clears throat> so, so here, this is the kind of the expectation value of B z squared, kind of. Uh, this is a typical a typical result, of course, the details depend on how you do it, but uh, a typical MV model calculation in, at infinite energy, uh, <coughs> at infinite energy and with the MV model, uh, relating QS to the MV model parameter in some way. And this is uh, EZ squared, so these are the transfers uh, these are the transverse and longitudinal uh, electric and magnetic fields. Kind of then uh, this scale is one. So kind of at the scale of at the scale of one over QS in tau, uh, the fields start looking very different. Okay, and this is of course related to the fact that related to the fact that if the fields depend have a typical momentum of QS. Uh, when you solve these field equations, uh, if, if there were no interactions, these would just be non-interacting waves and they would, the field modes would oscillate with the frequency of uh, QS or KT, which is typically of the order of QS. So you can think of these as field electric and magnetic field modes that are kind of oscillating, in the, oscillating with the frequency that is typically of the order of uh, QS. <coughs> and uh, then the, this uh, this would be like e x squared plus e y squared, and then the the other one, which is quite symmetrical, is uh, uh, b x squared plus b y squared. So the transfers, so the sum of the transverse uh, components and the sum sum of the transverse components of the magnetic field. Okay. So this is actually. Um, Uh, so this is what the, this is what a typical numerical solution uh, solution looks like. The transverse fields start at zero, but then after a time of one over QS, well, the way this is plotted, it looks like the transverse fields are as big as the longitudinal fields, but that's not quite right because uh, I have the sum of two transverse com the sum of two transverse components is approximately as large as the Z components. So this is not an this is not an isotropic uh, this is not an isotropic system. So and, and we'll go to that in a in a minute. Uh, if I think of these in terms of field modes, <coughs> this is a perfectly reasonable. Uh, I mean, my gluonic interpretation after when I go to large enough time, I should be able to interpret this as gluonic modes. Um, and this this is a perfectly somehow con this picture is perfectly consistent with the gluon. Uh, which has, I mean, a system of gluons with two polarization modes. You know that a gluon has two polarization states. You can define them as circular, you can choose them as circular polarization or linear polarization, and you can have different versions of different uh, bases. Here, the convenient way of thinking of these is linear polarization states. So there is one state that has a momentum in the transverse direction, Let's uh, let's say okay. Let's say that it has a momentum in the z x direction, uh, and it has a <coughs> so you can have states with a momentum in the x direction, uh, then a magnetic field in the z direction, and an electric field in the y direction or you can have a mode with a kx in a, with a magnetic field in the y direction and an electric field in the z direction or you can have a mode with ky momentum in the y direction a magnetic field in the z direction and electric field in the x direction or you can have a mo field with a momentum in the y direction a magnetic field in the x direction and an electric field 
in the z direction. Okay. So if you just think of this system as being some kind of a democratic superposition, a democratic collection of these kind of four, uh, four gluonic modes, uh, classical, classical radiation modes, so you note that we, we started with field, our field configurations are boost invariant. So basically, our, if we think of these fields as gluonic uh, modes, they don't have Z momentum. They only have momentum in the transverse component. And then because the electric and magnetic fields of a radiation particle have to be orthogonal to the momentum, this creates an asymmetry. You, there's two BZs here and only one BY and, and one BX, right? <coughs> so this kind of, and, and if, my, if my system is a somehow a democratic superposition of such modes, this, this kind of four modes, it is natural that B, the typical B, Z, B, Z component of the magnetic field is typically twice as large in, in the square as the X and Y components, because I have both of these, um, both of these modes have a Z component, but, but only this mode has a Y component, this mode has an X component. So kind of this kind of a thinking of this as, as a democratic superposition, superposition of these kind of four different linear polarization modes uh, is a quite a good uh, approx is, is a good explanation for this, these four curves being approximately equal here. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, so the system is not exactly three-dimensionally isotropic. It has some uh, asymmetry. Now the curious thing, and this the thing that makes the glasma, the, the thing that makes the glasma uh, somehow coherent, uh, and and the result of the boosting, and somehow the most non-trivial thing, the most non-trivial thing about this is that, is that if you think in terms of these modes. Uh, the modes all start in a very specific phase. So a typical radiation, a radiation mode is something that, a photon, is something that oscillates between electric and magnetic field, right? It oscillates with a frequency given by its momentum. It oscillates between electric and magnetic fields. If you do a Feynman perturbation theory calculation and you calculate, okay, I get the gluon which has some momentum kT, right? In this, in this Feynman, Feynman diagram perturbation theory calculation, you have no way of accessing whether at a specific point in time is this gluon, is this gluon in a magnetic field state or is it, has it oscillated to an electric field. It oscillates between electric and magnetic field with some phase, but, but somehow a, a perturbative diagrammatic calculation does not give you access to, okay, at this moment in time, is, does my gluon have an electric or magnetic field? And then at the next moment, which field does it have, right? Uh, you, uh, you, you don't track this kind of phase of, uh, of gluons in the inner perturbative calculation. So here, what the boost invariant does is that the boost invariance enforces a very specific uh, phase for these uh, oscillating modes. The boost invariance enforces that this particular mode, when it's created, it is created in a state where at tau equals zero it is here, and then only after tau equals one over qs it oscillates here. Likewise, this mode is created in a state where at tau equals zero it starts here, and then in a time given by its momentum, uh, it has oscillated here to the magnetic field. And this mode is created at time equal zero at this, uh, in this state. And then at the time of given by its momentum, it has oscillated to this and then it keeps oscillating back and forth between electric and magnetic with a frequency, with its own frequency. And the same thing here, this mode is uh, created in the state where it has, in the phase where it has this electric field and then it oscillates between its electric and magnetic fields given by some uh, component. Now, of course, if I only had one single, if all the momenta had one single value, I would see these kind of oscillations in this curve all the time. But of course, here, my system is a superposition of gluons, superposition of gluonic modes, which typically have KTs and frequencies of the order of QS, but it's a superposition. 
So when you go uh, after a certain time, these oscillations are out of phase, right? It's not like everybody is, not every single mode has oscillated to the transverse field at the same time. Some modes have a larger frequency and they get here earlier, and some modes have a slower frequency and they get to the transverse field later and they get out of phase. So they start, everybody starts in phase, but they have slightly different frequencies and they get out of phase. And then, uh, and then this is what you see when you, when they are kind of out of, when they're phase, they are out of phase and they, the phases are random and, and they go like, and go like this. Okay. So that, that, that is an interpretation of these, uh, interpretation of these things in terms of, uh, uh, interpretation of these things in, t in terms of uh, gluonic uh, field modes. You can, um, you can see this very explicitly in, um, Okay, so how should I? Yeah, um, uh, there are calculations, numerical calculations, where you uh, people actually do extract a spectrum of gluons. So what you do there is that you solve the equations of motion on the lattice, uh, then you go to QS tau much larger than one, so you go to late enough time so that this kind of uh, starts behaving in a linear way, then you Fourier decompose you have to fix the gauge but I, I don't want to get into that and on a general level you take the fields and you Fourier decompose them into transverse momentum you take a field and you call function of, function of coordinate, you Fourier transform and you get field modes as a function of coordinate. <coughs> and then you uh, identify in the somehow getting the factors right and making sure that you're consistent with the energy density. The energy density is gauge invariant, but this is the number density is not gauge invariant. But somehow with some slight uh, uncertainty, you can, uh, you can get a spectrum of gluons, which is uh, differential in rapidity because all the time we are, we are doing this in a, actually, because the glue fields are boost invariant, we do this in a two dimensional, two plus one dimension, two transfer spatial dimensions and time. But you do a numerical calculation without any kind of longitudinal coordinate. So you get things, get a gluon spectrum that is differential in rapidity. And what you get is something that is always 1 over alpha s, explicitly 1 over alpha s, and then some function of kt over qs, which is a, I don't know, some, some function of, uh, some function that goes down as a function of, of kt, okay, and this is, uh, this is qs. So you can calculate a gluon spectrum. The, the miracle is that it is, it is finite, infrared finite, and that's a non-trivial uh, that's a non so the non-trivial thing is that uh, the total number of gluons is infrared finite and in some sense th this, this is a result of not only of saturation in the incoming nuclei but this is a result of nonlinear interactions in the classical Young Mills. So a perturbative approach, perturbative calculation will not give you an infrared finite spectrum, infrared finite number of gluons without some additional somehow hocus pocus. <coughs> but the uh, but the classical classical Young Mills calculation does. So I th for me this is the biggest advantage of really solving fully uh, the classical Young Mills equations numerically is that. You, you have screening effects in the plasma which make the spectrum, uh, gluon spectrum, uh, infrared finite, okay? Um, analytically, analytically what you can do is that you can solve this whole thing if you take at least one of the two nuclei to be very dilute. So the color charge, 
uh, color charge density of at least one of the nuclei has to be very much smaller than, uh, I don't know, smaller than something. <laughs> to, to zero, yes. Uh, you can, at, at least one of the two color charge densities has to be zero, uh, taken to be very small, and then you linearize in the whole calculation from the beginning in the color charge density of one of the two nuclei, and then you can do this calculation analytically. What happens in the analytical calculation is that after tau equals zero, there are actually no interactions. After tau equals zero, uh, the, you just, you're just solving you are just solving analytically the linear equations of motion of this kind of, uh, this kind of radiation fields. So that's why you can do it. The solutions are Bessel J0s and Bessel J1s because, because of the boost invariance. But these are, it's a linear wave equation. You can solve it. And, uh, and that's it. And then you can compare, you can of course compare the numerics to the analytics and in the dilute, in, if, if at least one of the nuclei is dilute, it works. But if the most nuclei are dense, both color charge densities are large, uh, then it doesn't, except at, or for a very high uh, KT. The nice thing about the analytical calculation is that uh, the analytical calculation is something that you can, you can connect to perturbation theory. So the analytical calculation, when you, when you do the, when you get the result, you can really identify that it actually it actually matches this. Uh, so there's a, here's nucleus one, here's nucleus two. So here are the rows. Uh, here are the gauge fields of nucleus one. Here's the gauge field of nucleus two in some gauge. And then you have one three gluon vertex and kind of the, the, this three gluon vertex is uh, the, this, this three gluon, the physics of this three gluon vertex is hidden in the initial conditions. So that the AI3 is uh, AI1 plus AI2, and then A eta is the commutator. The physics, by looking at the analytical dilute limit, you can see that the physics of this three gluon vertex is really hidden in these uh, initial conditions. What the, what the cl classical field picture gives you is this, is this phase information. It tells you that the classical field picture tells you that everybody starts in the, man uh, everybody starts in the phase with a longitudinal field and not, and, and not in some other phase. A diagrammatical calculation like this, sure, it tells you that you, you get gluons, but it doesn't, tell, it doesn't give you information about how things happen as a function of time. But you can really map in this appropriate limit, you can map these two. And, and, and the physics. So this is why a lot of the things that you can understand qualitatively uh, by looking at the perturb perturbative thing. Also, this perturb perturbative calculation you can do in, in different gauges. You can also do this calculation in a covariant gauge without going to the light cone gauge. And you can see in this per perturbative calculation in what way it becomes more complicated, okay? Uh, so, so that is something you can you can connect this to a perturbative calculation of perturbative calculation of gluon production. And uh, one last thing, um, let me go here. One last thing related to the anisotropy. So, so I, I emphasized at the in the looking at the components that these fields are very that somehow this physical system is very anisotropic, and. Uh, the anisotropy becomes manifest if I plot uh, components of the energy momentum tensor, okay? So uh, energy momentum tensor, uh, I can think of it as energy uh, transfers, so tr transfers pressure, X pressure, uh, Y pressure, and uh, so I can calculate the energy momentum tensor. I have the fields, I have electric and magnetic fields. There's a well-defined expression for what the uh, T mu nu is, the energy momentum tensor. And then I, I just decide to call the zero, zero component, the energy density, I decide, call the diagonal components, spatial diagonal components, the pressures, okay? So I can just, I, I use the word for specific components of the energy momentum tensor, okay? And um, the way this uh, starts out is that 
Um, you start out you, you, you start out in a very curious thing. So first of, first of all, the energy density. I should go like this. So the energy density, it starts out at, at a constant, and uh, then at late time it goes like one over tau. And this is just the fact that we're doing a boost invariant thing. The whole system is expanding boost in a boost invariant way. So in some sense, energy per unit rapidity is conserved and the volume of a one unit of rapidity is growing with time because a rapidity is a, a one unit of rapidity grows like this, so it gets longer and longer. So the energy density grows do goes down like one over tau if everything is independent of unit rapidity. Then the transverse pressure, um, let me try to do this a little bit more carefully uh, so that you can see this is not very, so the transverse pressure, uh, transverse pressure starts out at being exactly the energy density. And then it becomes, so the Px and Py become one half of the energy density at late times. But here Px and Py are the same as the energy density. Oh, and this is classical Young-Mills. It is a explicitly uh, scale invariant conformal theory. So this means that the energy density is always the sum of the three pressures. So this means that the, this means that the longitudinal pressure starts at being minus epsilon, minus energy density. And then it goes very quickly to zero. So you go from an initial state where transverse pressures are the same as energy density, and the longitudinal pressure is minus the energy density. So this is a <coughs> PZ. So this is the configuration of uh, longitudinal color fields. Longitudinal magnetic and electric uh, fields is that that is a configuration where the, some component of the uh, pressure is negative. It's kind of that's, that's that is the Lund string. Uh, but then after you kind of go into this decohered phase, when you can think of these as independent gluons in these polarization states, uh, then this PZ here is much less than the transverse pressures. So this kind of is this isot uh, this is a very anisotropic state. And this is the state where you can think of it, the state as being gluons with momentum in the transverse direction only. And because the gluon momenta are only in the transverse direction, the system is very anisotropic in terms of, in terms of, uh, <coughs> in terms of its pressure. So this is something that if you want to match this to hydrodynamics, it means that the, the viscous correction your uh, shear, shear viscous correction to Timmy nu is very large. And this has been uh, the, the starting point for a lot of literature in the field over the last uh, 15 years about how does such a system become an iso al almost isotropic uh, plasma that can be then start put in into as an initial condition to hydrodynamics. <coughs> so, but this, this boost invariant classical field simulations by themselves, they do not give you an, a locally isotropic plasma. They're, they're, the system is not allowed to isotropize. It turns out that even three-dimensional uh, classical yang mill simulations do not give you an isotropic, uh, an isotropic, locally isotropic system. But you really need to go beyond the classical, classical limit to, uh, thermo to somehow quantum <laughs> effects to uh, thermalize. And this, this was the topic of Florian Lindenbauer's talk a couple of days ago. So he was, you can, he, he, he can tell you all that you want to know about how, how one goes from this state to an actual uh, plasma. But I think this is a good place to stop. We're already over time.